Good afternoon. So, um, welcome uh, to this keynote address. Um, we're a group of us here. You might, those of you who are used to the familiar faces in CCI will see a new, less familiar faces. And we're coming towards the end of a, a week of um, workshops and events with a set of new grantees um, or in principle grantees of the Endangered Landscapes Programme, which um, I hope most of you will know is a, a, a programme of CCI that's focused on landscape restoration in Europe. Um, and so we're now at the point um, of having our keynote address, which is a part of our, uh, our week's events. And I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Dr. Tundi Agadi, um, who is going to um, talk to us this evening. So I'm going to read out um, uh, Tundi's kind of uh, bio for you. Um, I have managed to memorise all of this. So Tundi has worked in marine conservation, might I have to say this, for over four decades um, in the Caribbean, Mediterranean, Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Her work has been focused on marine protected areas, fisheries management, marine spatial planning and ecosystem-based management. Tundi was a marine policy fellow at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and did her postdoc there um, and then joined the conservation world, working for WWF as senior scientist and then Conservation International as global marine program director. So since 2000, Tundi has advised governments, foundations, and NGOs on marine conservation through her consultancy, Sound Seas. So we're very lucky to have Tundi um, as a member of the ELP's oversight and selection panel. Um, and that's the group that recommends projects for funding and provides strategic advice and support um, to the programme. So Tundi and I recently visited Turkey together um, and a project there implemented by FFI, one of the BirdLife partners, a marine project there. Um, and as someone who has their professional feet firmly rooted on terra firma, it was really an eye-opener and very stimulating and challenging to hear from Tundi about large-scale restoration issues from a marine perspective. So I'm sure we're all going to have that privilege um, now as Tundi talked to us about successful seascapes, um, reflecting on what makes for healthy, rich and resilient marine ecosystems at scale. Tundi is going to describe the challenges inherent in ocean conservation and the urgent need to think big. So Tundi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, everyone. Can you hear me okay? So um, David and the ELP crew asked uh, for me to give a keynote on a day that is really about communities um, with the Endangered Landscapes Program. So although I'll be talking about the sea, and although there are no human communities in the sea, um, I'll be talking about how uh, people are so fundamental getting it right with the oceans and to reversing the tide of degradation um, that the oceans have faced. Now many people in the room are living this already, so Sue Wells and other people, uh, the, the team that's here from the Solon Seascape um, are actually doing the hard work of reversing the tide of degradation. I'm going to be talking very um, kind of generically today about what it takes to make a successful seascape, um, and drawing from examples from around the world, um, but trying to think about generalities um, and common principles and common approaches that lead to success. Um, I hope to leave a lot of time for a discussion, an animated discussion. I know that um, ELP grantees are exhausted. It's been a long week. Um, and so I will try to keep my um, I talk fairly short and try and get into some animated discussion at the end, drawing on, ex on examples uh, from around the world. So please save your questions, comments, criticisms, um, and I'll make sure that I'll have plenty of time so that we can discuss some of these matters. So we all know that the oceans are um, immensely valuable to humanity um, and to life on the planet more generally. Um, there is, has been over the last couple of decades, a real emphasis on trying to look at ocean 
um, ecosystems and the resources and services that they provide and how that ties to human well-being, not just to human well-being for coastal communities, but also human well-being more broadly. Just maintaining life on the planet is one of the key roles of ocean ecosystems. Um, oceans are also very valuable from a monetary sense. They contribute to the global economy, uh, not just ocean resources, but also oceans as systems of transportation, recognizing that in a globalized world, most of our products um, are delivered around the planet uh, via shipping. Um, oceans are critically important, of course, of course, for coastal communities as well. So they provide a lot of food security, they provide livelihood opportunities, they provide places to live, to develop and maintain cultures. Um, so we can think about um, the ma many myriad ways in which oceans fulfill human well-being, uh, contribute to well-being into the future. Um, at the same time, we know that oceans are being degraded and that a lot of these services and values are being lost and diminished. Um, we have many, many uh, threats that affect oceans, many pressures simultaneously, and in many places, oceans are, I should say ocean. Without the S, I would be called out by my marine colleagues for uh, putting the S on, so let's say ocean and seas um, are suffering the death of a thousand cuts, many, many cumulative impacts affecting them simultaneously. Uh, what the end result of that is, is that ocean landscapes, coastal landscapes are the most altered in the world. Um, the ocean coastal belt, which is variously defined, different people calculations on what constitutes the coastal population, but in general about half the world population lives in the coast. Uh, it is the area where the population doubling rate is the highest uh, and the densities are the highest. So we have a situation where uh, the intrinsic rate of population in the coastal area, human population is very high. We also have a lot of now environmental refugees uh, migrating to the coast from uh, lands that can no longer support them. So there's a lot of that movement as well. And in the future, we'll see some movement in the reverse direction as coastal areas get more and more impacted by climate change, including sea level rise and uh, coastal storms and cyclones and so forth. But we have enormous pressures in the it's a very, very thin strip of land. It's only about 5% of the world's landmass. So this 5% of the world's landmass holds about half the world population and has a disproportionate number of ecosystem services that are being delivered to the humans and the rest of nature. By the way, this uh, picture is, um, I stole it from Life magazine. Probably none of you even know what Life Magazine is because it was around many, many decades ago. Um, very large format of a picture magazine. Uh, and it's the mouth of the Niger Delta, uh, a, a fishery on anadromous fish that come in from the sea and swim up river to, to spawn. Uh, this fishery no longer exists because of uh, the pressures put on it uh, on pre spawning fish. I, I have never known the photographer. Someday somebody's going to ask me who the photographer is and why I didn't credit him or her. So um, I should probably find that. Anyway, ecosystem services, I, I mentioned that there's a disproportionate number of them in the coastal area. Um, they are many, and I'll speak a little bit to them in more detail, um, but they're essentially the pull factors that have set the patterns of human uh, settlement um, in the coastal area. They're pull factors that bring people in um, to particular parts of the coastal area uh, to support them. Um, and the pull factors include not just resources, but also access to navigation. So many of, much of the world's population 
actually situated very near a very large estuary. And if it's this figure, 71% of the world's coastal population lives within 50 kilometers of a major estuary. So the coastal population is not evenly scattered around the coastal zones. It's centered, very much focused on areas, transition areas, areas between land and sea. The fresh water delivers nutrients to the marine environment, provides spawning areas for marine fishes, provides humans access to navigation, and provides living space um, and food and so forth. This figure is from 2005 from the Millennium Assessment, so this has probably changed a little bit um, since that time. But just to make the point, these are ecologically critical areas, not estuarian areas, uh, and the surrounding um, wetlands. Uh, and these are areas that provide more uh, ecologically important goods and services than other areas, and at the same time are more vulnerable to degradation in many other areas. So we have a kind of difficult situation <laughs> in which the pressures are enormous and the values are enormous, uh, and right now the pressures are overcoming uh, the ability of many of these systems to, it, to be able to continue to provide these values. However, I want to point out, uh, and this is something that I think is lost in, um, in much of the discussions around humans and their impacts on the environment, um, and it's certainly something that was uh, discussed in the Millennium Assessment and then kind of disappeared uh, into the nether Netherlands, um, there is really no simple linear relationship between the number of people living on a coast and the environment of that coast, the environmental condition of that coast, the extent to which the coast is degraded. Uh, there was a tendency, I think, in the last 30 years to really equate high population density with degradation and to be very simplistic about thinking about what do we need to do? Well, we need to stop people from you know, uh, overusing resources. We need to control settlements, we need to control development. Um, and that is, to some extent, true. But what is actually more true is that consumption patterns are what really drive degradation. So you can have very high densities of people living in coastal areas and living sustainably in those coastal areas. Whereas you can have areas where there's a low density of people with an enormous amount of consumption going on, and um, a very short-sighted uh, way of looking at the world where profit is driving uh, immediate uh, development, immediate uh, investment in development, which has an immediate return on with profits, um, and not thinking long-term about uh, whether that's sustainable, uh, and whether uh, profits will, you know, continue to flow to subsequent generations. So we need to get away from this idea that people are the problem, and particularly that coastal communities are the problem. Coastal communities are actually the solution to the degradation that we have in the world, in the world's ocean. Uh, and we need to stop thinking about numbers of people as being the problem. We need to start thinking about how people live in their environments, and to what extent we can encourage living sustainably. Whether the, and that doesn't mean uh, living in a primitive way uh, in the environment. It means living sustainably according to um, the, the level of development that exists in that place. And I'll, I'll come up with some examples of what I mean by this. Um, we. We in the Western world don't really like this narrative. <laughs> so we in the Western world, uh, I think, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say, um, have oversimplified this situation with respect to degradation and human population. And I don't think any of us kind of would fall into this category of thinking about um, 
you know, putting the pressure on developing country um, societies as needing to fix what they're doing uh, so that we all can benefit from promotions and promotion resources. Um, but there is still this kind of old fashioned notion um, that somehow the developed world, the industrialized world, has the solutions and the developing world has to accept the solutions. Uh, there are solutions um, in order to live sustainably. And I think this is a paradigm we need to get away from. Um, what we have is now a situation where uh, much of our consumption in the developed world is driving an inability for coastal communities to access the resources they need. Um, with fewer and fewer resources available, uh, there is a kind of rush to the bottom of overexploitation, of uh, a breakdown in kind of societal norms that prevent overexploitation or prevent uh, you know, un unsustainable ways of living. Uh, so we need to kind of fix, fix the driver of this uh, before we can expect people to uh, live sustainably in their environments. We also need to fix what's broken. Uh, and by that, I mean we need to clean up the messes that we've created uh, with, our, with our consumption, with our uh, drive to uh, use more and more of the you know, resources um, and not think long term about uh, what the implications of that is. So we do need restoration, and we need restoration at a very large scale. So far, we've seen a lot of restoration, which is successful, which is very small scale. And we need, we're at the point now where we need to think about how we come to scale and really scale it up uh, to the point where we get, we shift the whole, oops, oops uh -oh. it's okay, <laughs> one second. <laughs> uh, and if you come closer, I think it'll be a little bit more sensitive as well. Uh, okay, well, let's see if I can start from this slide rather than. Thanks. So what does large scale restoration entail? Uh, well, first we have to acknowledge that doing restoration in the marine environment is completely different from doing it on land. Uh, as well, people know, uh, everyone who, it, who works in this domain knows uh, that we suffer from, uh, we suffer because there are challenges um, in the difference in between marine ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems. And also we suffer from the way that institutions are structured and the way that humans uh, relate to the sea versus how they relate to land. Um, we have situations where, uh, we were just talking about this today, where um, on land you have private property ownership of land. Uh, and for restoration purposes, you can acquire lands do what you need to do, do the interventions you need to do in a very controlled setting to be able to uh, bring the wildlands back. Uh, in the sea, we don't have private property ownership for the most part. We have um, use rights, uh, but it's a very complicated set of use rights. Um, and these systems are very open and unbounded. And what it means is that uh, all these cumulative effects can be both in situ and coming from and exogenous forces coming from outside uh, affecting the marine system. Uh, we also have kind of non-porous <laughs> borders of ecosystems, or porous borders of ecosystems, I should say, where degradation comes from afar, um, but also um, the ability to uh, manage uses also um, can't be bounded very easily and can't be controlled very easily. I put this old old slide up here. Um, John Steele from Woods Hole um, published a, a seminal book on the difference between marine ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems, which shook people up and started people debating this. Um, and for a long time, terrestrial folks said, well, it's just a difference in degree. It's not a difference. And that probably is true, that it's just a difference in degree, um, but marine ecosystems aren't completely different from 
extraterrestrial. But the way that societies deal with marine reefs and the way that um, legal and uh, legal institutions and regulations apply in the marine environment is so very different from uh, land that it is it does create special challenges for doing restoration and conservation in the sea. Um, what we mean, or what we, when those of us who work in um, either conservation or restoration talk about the need to think big, what we're really talking about is taking an ecosystem approach uh, and recognizing that these marine systems are all very uh, interconnected over very large areas so that the spatial scale is very large in marine systems versus land systems, uh, while the temporal scale is actually much shorter so, uh, than land systems. So you can get a response to an intervention much more quickly in the marine system than you can in a land system, typically. Um, but you we need to think about doing this over a very, very large landscape. And that means that you have to, if you are trying to get a particular response to an intervention or a set of interventions, uh, which is restoring some kind of ecosystem processes and thereby restoring ecosystem services and values, um, you're going to have to be strategic over a very large area to think about how, how to get that outcome that you're looking for. And we'll talk about five principles kind of behind ecosystem-based management um, when it applies to the marine environment, five general principles, and these are very, very broad. Um, but the first one is this one of the recognizing the connections. So, um, put simply, um, to take a coral reef analogy, um, if one has a degraded coral reef and wants to restore it, it's not going to be enough to patch the reef with corals. To this, you'll see this in a lot in the media. Coral restoration is all about taking corals that are grown in a nursery and cementing them onto a reef that's degraded. I, I'm, being, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, so forgive me, <laughs> and simplistic, but this idea of kind of rest, restoring the physical structure of the reef and doing nothing more than that um, will, will obviously not work, but that in order for uh, reef rest, uh, restoration to occur properly, we need to think about associated habitats, so seagrass meadows that support a lot of the organisms that live on the reef um, for either breeding or for feeding. Um, mangrove systems that similarly provide nursery habitat and provide nutrients, maintain water quality. Um, mangrove systems associated with reefs also need to be restored if the reef health is going to be restored. And most importantly, if we think about coral reef um, example, it's not enough to focus on the structure of the reef. Uh, it's not enough to patch the reef with corals and to cement them on there. It, it, it gives it's a good visual, uh, <laughs> and it does actually it has it serves a very important purpose in motivating people to care about the reef and thinking that they're doing good things. Uh, encouraging more and more investment in restoration. So I'm not trying to diss um, oral restoration. Um, I'm just trying to say that it's not enough to do that. To think about uh, fixing the structure of the reef, what's broken, uh, but more importantly, fixing the physiology, fixing the ecosystem processes that are happening on the reef. Um, and I make the analogy of, um, of anatomy versus physiology. You have a sick patient and you're a doctor. You look at the anatomy to give you clues about what's going on in the physiology. Ultimately, you don't care much too much about the anatomy. I mean, it's good to have legs that work and arms that work and uh, you know everything intact. But what you really care about is keeping the system going and keeping those processes going. And sim similarly for the marine environment. So recognizing the connections, how the physiology plays out, uh, what contributes to maintaining a healthy marine ecosystem. Uh, and then finding out what it is that's broken in that system, what it is that is impairing uh, the ability of that system to be healthy. And 
in many cases, that's going to be actually something that's not marine. In many cases, it's going to be the destruction of coastal wetlands or uh, a highly polluted river dumping um, poisons into the environment or uh, deforestation of mangroves. Uh, and so when we talk about doing marine restoration, what we often are talking about is doing what we can do in situ in the sea uh, to restore ecosystems and to give them a, a leg up on natural recovery, but also addressing some of these indirect drivers of degradation, uh, like water pollution coming from runoff or deforestation or wetlands destruction or something. So knowing, first of all, how it's all interconnected allows you to then craft a strategic response to fixing any problems that are there. Uh, another um, principle kind of ecosystem-based management is to think about uh, an ecosystem services approach. And by that, that gets a little bit at the physiology because ecosystem services really are just the visual, the visible kind of outcomes or outputs of a healthy functioning system. Right? Um, but it's also a way of communicating uh, to the public why it's important to make the investment in conservation or restoration. Uh, an ecosystem services approach allows you to, to value, and by this I don't mean monetary value, I don't mean to attach a dollar figure to a system, but to think about the various things that the ecosystem provides humanity, the various services, goods and services that it, it provides, um, and to think of them holistically, focus on only mm -hmm. one service. And this is a typical, typical, uh, I think, uh, pitfall of a lot of conservation is that um, there will be too much emphasis on one service that's being delivered and an attempt to try and do conservation around that one service uh, at the expense of other services. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, in UAE, in the United Arab Emirates, um, the United Arab Emirates, interestingly, was the first country in the world to do mangrove restoration. Uh, many, many years ago, the founding shape of the UAE had a real interest in mangroves, actually forests of all kinds, but particularly was interested in mangroves. So he started in 1968 with mangrove plantations. Uh, and they became very successful at growing mangrove seedlings and placing them out in the mud and creating mangrove where there was no mangrove before. Uh, so they were doing this quite well. Uh, and they got a little bit carried away with their own success, I think, because what they ended up doing was thinking about, and they were doing this, I have to say, primarily from the standpoint of aesthetics. Uh, they really liked the greenery around the coast. So if you look at all of the, all of the palaces that belong to the royal family, uh, they're all on the coast. They're all surrounded by mangroves. They're all brilliant green, and in a desert environment, it's, it's I think culturally something that you know, people associated oases with life. Uh, they were nomadic people, and um, so green to them is life. And putting greenery around their properties, you know, was an added value. So the mangrove. Uh, Nurseries were really meant to improve the aesthetic aesthetics of the seascapes and the landscapes. Uh, but what they started doing was destroying other kinds of habitat to create these mangrove plantations. So destroying seagrass meadows to put in landfill uh, to infill and create new lands to then plant mangrove seedlings. So you have to see the maximization of one service while the other services are um, are declining, and uh, many of these mangrove plantations, they're single species, uh, planted in this kind of grid pattern. Some of them, some of the plantations don't even have access to the ocean, so mangroves are not providing any kind of water quality balancing or hydrological balancing or uh, fish nursery habitat or so forth. So I, I, 
up there are no people from UAE. <laughs> no one will take offense at my, at my characterization of this, but just as an example, that this actually does happen, that people will focus on one, one ecosystem service and maximize it and not think about all of the other services that need to be maintained and also have value. Um, related to this a little bit is this idea of um, it's really important to be holistic and address cumulative impacts. So if you take an ecosystem of service approach and if you understand the connections between different kinds of habitats and, and even freshwater and upland areas, um, then you can start to think about the drivers of degradation and understand um, that in no system anywhere in the world no coastal system do we have a situation where there's only one pressure and we just need to alleviate that pressure and everything will be fine. Everywhere in the world we have now pollution problems, we have invasive species, we have overfishing generally, um, we have habitat loss in the coastal zone and we have oceans acting as a sink or freshwater pollution coming in from either runoff or from river outlets. So in order to really get it right in terms of um, doing conservation and restoration, we have to address all of these impacts and really prioritize what are the main ones that are contributing to degradation and what are the ones that we can actually manage with our restoration and, and conservation. Um, related to this is this idea that it's not enough to just control one kind of use. Uh, it's important to think about integrating management so that a lot of different uses like fishing, tourism, development, uh, shipping are all addressed with the management and conservation. And then the last principle is just this idea of adaptive management, which is so important, especially now with climate change, changing everything in the coastal zone very rapidly. You know, we're having increased um, incidence of heat wave events, um, fish distributions changing all the time, which is affecting how uh, people derive protein and food from fish, fisheries. Um, we have sea level rise, which is, of course, changing um, habitats and affecting human settlements as well. Um, so to think about the restoration and conservation uh, interventions, not just as a static kind of fix to a problem, but also as a way to learn uh, what's going on as, as things change um, and to be ready and able to adapt management and, and restoration uh, to the changes that happen. So all of this means that we really need to be working at very large scales and we need to be thinking very strategically. Um, it also means that we need to engage people uh, of a lot of different uh, walks of life, different kinds of stakeholders, sometimes stakeholders that we feel um, some animus towards. And by that I mean stakeholders that uh, are maybe publicly opposed to conservation, um, may be exerting their power um, to really control the consumption and use of marine um, resources and space. So, um, and by that I mean conservationists, I think, like to um, work with local communities and have to work with local communities um, and are less um, prone to work with some of the other stakeholders uh, <laughs> that might might need to be drawn in. Uh, and that could be oil and gas in interest, that could be military, that could be uh, it could be water authorities, freshwater authorities, um, land use um, agencies, and so forth. So if we really are going to get this right, we really need to engage with as broad stakeholder groups as possible. But at the same time, I think it's critically important to go back to that first point that I was trying to make, which is that people, coastal communities, are not the problem. Coastal communities are going to be where we move the solutions. And all the other stakeholders need to be involved. The coastal communities are the, are the 
the kind of base level in which we need to put our investment and in which uh, we need to strengthen so that other stakeholders um, come to the table and don't dominate. We need to elevate the, the kind of ability of coastal communities to be able to be the stewards of their own uh, backyards um, and to have a fair chance of fighting these other kinds of uh, user groups uh, that often dominate. And I have to say that uh, one of the user groups, typically in a lot of marine planning right now, uh, that is getting dominated by a lot of large scale industrial interests are conservationists. If you look at the European Union and the um, Marine Spatial, Maritime Spatial Planning Directive, uh, you'll note that conservation is considered a stakeholder group. Conservationists are considered a stakeholder group. Conservation is really considered a special interest. Uh, and it's a special interest at the table that comes together with a lot of other special interests which are much more powerful uh, and which drive a lot of the, the planning decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is why I think it's important for we conservationists to work with local communities to build up their power, their ability to participate in negotiations around sea use, um, to arm them to the maximum extent possible with the information that we have derived from science and ecology, um, to arm them with information we have about the values of marine systems um, and the importance of uh, getting restoration and conservation right. Um, marine spatial planning areas, um, so special areas under marine spatial plans and marine protected areas are great at conserving ecological important areas, but they're not enough. Um, but, and at the same time, restoration is critically important, but passive restoration is not going to be enough uh, to recover a lot of these marine systems. And by that I mean it's not going to be enough to reduce um, a threat. Typically it's fisheries that are produced. So it's not enough to draw a line on the map and say there's not going to be any fishing there in this area and walk away saying that that system is going to recover. It will not probably recover. Uh, so that kind of leaving it up to kind of passive recovery is not going to be enough. It's going to require not only working with a lot of different pressures and addressing a lot of different pressures, but also doing active restoration uh, alongside the passive restoration. Trying to give these systems a kind of head start or a kickstart uh, kick uh, for the road to recovery. So we need both conservation and restoration, both passive restoration and active restoration. And we need to do it at large scales. And it all sounds so daunting and everybody looks very depressed. So, and you look very tired, I know, so I'll stop talking now. Um, we can do this. Uh, and I think that we really have a better chance of getting this right in restoration than we do in conservation. And the reason I say this, and I know this is, I see a lot of you are looking very uncomfortable because you're all conservationists in the room probably. I am one to myself, but um, I say this because I think conservationists, marine conservationists, have a tendency to reach for the solution sometimes before they understand the problem. That a lot of, for instance, marine protected areas are not really fit for purpose. They're something that's pulled off the shelf and applied. Uh, they work, uh, often work but they work in special circumstances where the threat that is being debated to, uh, being evaded by the protected area is the threat that's driving the degradation. If the threat that's driving the degradation is not the threat that is addressed in the protected area, there's not going to be any So protected areas need to be fit for purpose and that's not um, happening all the time with marine. 
Yes, or with Moody's facial exam. Um, but restoration is a little bit different because we cannot do restoration without understanding the problem. A priori, you have to have scoped what is going on with the system. What are the connections between different habitats? What's the relationship between use or overuse or degradation of habitat and condition of the habitat? So people who engage in restoration really understand the problem that they're trying to solve. And the solution is always good for birds. So I'm very, very optimistic <laughs> that restoration, marine restoration, is possible. It's been demonstrated to work at small scales, and that I think with this kind of an approach of being addressing the problem, scoping the problem, creating solutions that are fit for purpose, that really address the drivers of regulation, uh, we will start to see a reverse in the, in the state of many of these ecosystems that are uh, recovered. And because because marine ecosystems respond more rapidly than terrestrial ecosystems, we also have the ability to see results very quickly. So I'm really optimistic. You don't look optimistic. <laughs> you look tired <laughs> and grouchy. <laughs> I am optimistic that we can get this right um, and that the future is one in which we see more and more of these demonstration projects really illuminating what needs to be done, uh, where people learn from each other, where the commonalities between working in rest marine restoration and the tropics versus in the polar regions, those commonalities can be drawn out to kind of come up with guiding principles that work everywhere, even though the actual restoration projects and the interventions that people do will be very, very specific, be specific, fit for purpose, um, and work according to the circumstances of the place. So the three elements of success I'm going to end here are, in my mind, um, one is being strategic, really scoping the problem well, um, and thinking about what kinds of interventions are going to lead to what kinds of outcomes. Um, you know, creating these solutions that are fit for purpose, not pulling them off the shelf, but really thinking about crafting solutions that fit for purpose. Um, and then thirdly, addressing these issues of equity and really elevating coastal communities and their ability, empowering them really, to be stewards and to show um, how this recovery can, can happen. We have to do this. Uh, right now, we're in a, in a situation where big pushes for blue growth and the blue economy. And even though the blue economy, you know, um, makes reference to the three pillars, the environmental, the economic, and the social, uh, right now, in many, many countries, there's decisions being made on access to marine areas uh, and to investment in uh, developing marine uh, industries. These decisions are being made the idea of un unlocking the blue growth potential, of really trying to get the oceans to deliver uh, higher GDP and uh, opportunities for businesses and so forth. This is the time that we really need to influence these decisions that are being made and really need to think about showing how restoration can benefit a wide variety of stakeholders reverse this kind of trend in degradation that we've seen all over the world. So with that, I'm going to end. I don't have really much, much time for questions, but I'm, I hope you will ask it or comment or at least get up and stretch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Certainly, we do have time for questions. So, uh, well, um, Grandma. Hello. Uh, hi, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. I'm not actually in marine restoration, but uh, just for understanding, in regards to the uh, pH of the seawater and the uh, 
the temperature, I mean, how does this affect the restoration? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to repeat the questions each time for yeah. the sake of those online. Okay. So the question was, how does the how does um, pH of the water and ocean temperatures affect restoration and recovery? Yeah, it's a really good question. So ocean acidification is definitely a problem in much of the coastal areas of the world, and uh, temperature changes are a problem, particularly because temperature together with uh, Eutrophication, so too much nutrients getting into the water, uh, and a shutdown in the. I won't get into too much of this <laughs> very gloomy story, but a, a slowdown in the ocean conveyor belt, so this slowdown in ocean circulation, those three things together, so warming, eutrophication, and a slowdown of the um, circulation, is really causing a lot of kind of stagnation in the systems and a lot of disease spread and a lot of imbalances. Um, so this is definitely affecting the ability of the systems to recover. Uh, and what it might mean is that it, it, additional interventions that you know maybe in the past we would have not needed to recover a degraded system might be needed. But um, there is hope also uh, it's implausible that we'll be able to fix ocean acidification or warming, even if we were to miraculously stop carbon dioxide emissions, right? So we all know the, the inevitability of warming and, and acidification. However, there are things that can be done with localized kind of almost uh, microclimate changes. For instance, uh, people typically, uh, when they're restoring a coral reef, We'll think about planting seagrass alongside in areas where there weren't seagrass before, but not in, not to restore seagrass meadows, but to use seagrass plants um, to uh, reduce to increase the pH um, and to uh, take away um, the nutrients, which combined with the temperature, you know, cause a disease spread. So you can do these little these little, I call them little because they're small scale, little things to do localized improvement in water quality uh, and kind of counteract some of that uh, drivers of climate change. But those are definitely a factor. And just one more thing to say about that is I, I think it also affects the choices of where we would do restoration. Uh, so we might best think about projecting kind of how how temperature changes, for instance, will change the distribution of species and, and even affect habitat coverage. And we might want to put our investment into a place where that in the future might be a more important refugia for species or where critically important species may be moving. Think about right whales, for instance, northern right whale on the Atlantic. Uh, <coughs> huge attempts to conserve them where they were, uh, but then they shifted because their prey shifted way to the north. And so essentially they moved out of the area that was protected for them, where they had changed the shipping lanes and everything to avoid ship strikes. Um, and now they're in a completely different place uh, and they're, they're not being protected. So projecting into the future to drive kind of where you, where to make the conservation of conservation and restoration investment. Thank you and apologies for coming in a bit late. Um, my name is Terra Mustam and I work for an organization called Snow Change and we have a large Arctic coastal and marine work uh, from Alaska to Canada, Greenland and Switzerland, Siberia as well, but nothing happened in February, so <clears throat> oh, well. But then um, I would like to ask you very, very uh, quickly what's your take on the applicability or use of the 2019 uh, agreement of the Polar Sea and the, the shall we say, uh, research treaty between EU, Korea, Russia, China uh, on prevention of fisheries in the Polar, polar Sea? And to see that this could be a model for what you said on the last 
Okay, so the, the, the question in brief is um, asking about the effectiveness um, of the 2019 Arctic uh, Polar Treaty on uh, oceans and, and fisheries and whether it could be a model. Yeah. I, honestly, I don't know too much about I see to the tropics um, for the most part. Uh, I don't know much about the, the treaty except what I've heard in the media actually, so I'm kind of ignorant about it. But um, I do know that there's been a lot of um, efforts which I've been involved with actually to identify um, important areas um, within the Arctic that are going to be uh, kind of like a blueprint for thinking about long term um, investment and protecting special places. Um, and as more and more of the ice melts and as shifting lakes, um, navigation channels increase, and who knows what's going to go on with oil and gas, uh, or even the Arctic now. Uh, uh, I think having that kind of blueprint of the most ecologically vulnerable and critical areas is going to be critically important. So uh, any kind of international agreement, though, that joins fisheries or has countries thinking about shared resources is a good <laughs> and a good recommendation. So. Yes. Hi. Um, so I don't know much about marine restoration, so I'm just wondering how different is the funding sources for restoration, marine restoration, marine conservation? And my question comes, if you can tell us a little bit more how that difference is, because when we think about land restoration, a lot comes from the private sector. And in the marine arenas, how are the communities engaged or are participating in decision making of restoration? Yeah, it's such a good question, such a complicated question to answer to. <laughs> yeah, sorry for asking the funding questions. <laughs> so first of all, let me say there hasn't been much investment in marine restoration. Uh, so that is, uh, there has been a lot of interest in fixing spoken things. So, um, so for instance, with um, ship groundings on coral reefs, there, there, there are appeals that happen in the wake of that kind of disaster. Uh, and the public generally supports fixing of, of those kinds of damages. Uh, and that's where this idea, I think, of coral reef restoration is, you know, putting pieces of cementing corals onto the coral reef and calling that restoration. I think that's where that came from, because originally it was when ships ground hit a coral reef. That is a good way to fix uh, a coral reef this is been damaged by ships, but if a coral reef has been damaged by, you know, overfishing and pollution and uh, siltation from development on the coast um, and inputs from rivers and so forth, um, then putting these things on is not right. So there, and well, to back to your question, um, there is a lot of public donations going towards this kind of restoration. Which isn't really restoration in my mind, but anyway, it's, uh, it's a way for people to feel like they can be engaged. It's almost like beach cleanups. Beach cleanups are also, I mean, they're great for engaging the public, right? And, you know, everybody would rather see a clean beach than a littered beach. But in terms of the actual impact on the ecology, it's probably not helping that much to take litter off the beach. Uh, so the same way with this. So, um, I, you know, donor interest in marine restoration um, has been limited because marine restoration hasn't been shown to get to work very well. Uh, with the exception of ELP and some other programs, um, it's been a focus more on conservation and allowing the kind of passive recovery of the systems as opposed to the active restoration. Um, but I think that's changing now. People are seeing that restoration is possible, and mangrove, seagrass uh, restoration, those methodologies have been worked out quite well, and so now we're seeing fairly large-scale restoration that's very successful and done very well. Uh, coral reefs, uh, also not just this pasting on of fragments, but also you know real bonafide coral reef restoration that's also going on. 
salt marsh restoration has been happening for a long time, and estuaries, you know, if you look at many of the world's most degraded estuaries, many of them have been, you know, partially restored or even fully restored um, through a complex set of actors working on different elements. So, um, so I think there's now a more and more um, donor interest, and this is the UN Decade of Restoration. Uh, a lot of emphasis on what that means in the marine environment, and a lot of next two weeks in the UN um, Conference on Oceans in Lisbon, um, there's days dedicated to restoration of the marine environment and to funding that. So people will now see a, a big in injection of funding to marine restoration. Just, just to add, if you're interested in more that kind of analysis, the ELP to work with um, UNEP WCMC um, to look at funding of restoration over the last 10 years in Europe, where it's gone and who provided it. And that shows the distribution and balance between terrestrial and marine and who was funding restoration, private sector, government, philanthropists, so on. So that report's available on our website. What is the number? You know? I don't know. I'm not going to <laughs> come up with <laughs> the number, yeah, it's but it's all in there and beautiful, colourful. Um, infographics and figures, so <laughs> do take a look again. I think we've got time. We'll have, we're scheduled to finish up at five. We'll take one more question. What I would say for those who have also still got questions is we're going next door for wine and nibbles. So, the, you know, those who've got questions and haven't had a chance to ask them, um, speak to Chenji at that stage. But we'll take one more question from. <laughs> just, yeah, just to let you know online there was one question but it's already been answered so they're very happy <laughs> um Okay, so again, benefit of those online. The question is about examples of um, deep water restoration away from the coast. Yeah, um, so I, I think there's an interest in looking at deep water restoration, particularly with um, some of the damaging activities that humans have done to deep water um, out, out of sight, out of mind, and whether that's mining um, or whether that's um, Bottom fishing that we use these um, spot trawls that can destroy corals and other um, deep water corals and other bedrocks. Uh, there is an interest in that. It's extremely expensive to do anything between open seas and open seas. So um, there have been uh, there has been work in some sea on areas to do restoration that involves more passive restoration. Some of these damaging activities and then monitoring, doing monitoring. And um, as far as I know, there's not been. Uh, so can you think of any deep water active restoration? I, I can't think of anything where they would. There is now a, a lot of talk about carbon capture in the deep sea. Um, and I've heard people who are promoting carbon capture in the deep sea injecting carbon into the seafloor. Uh, saying that at the same time they're going to do that, they're going to restore. Uh, but I think that's just marketing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, we're going to leave it there. So um, please just put your hands together one more time. So thanks for the So, and as I say, I think. I'm looking at someone who can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're doing drinks in the atrium this time. Yeah, so a great position, drinks this time in the atrium because our workshop functions are going to continue next door. So please, yeah, join us next. Join us in the atrium.